Chapter 8, 20 Days. Two weeks after I buried my dog, cholera swept over our district. Doctors said the sickness started in southern Malawi back in November. A farmer visiting a funeral brought it north where it spread like grass fire. Within days, hundreds of people were sick and 12 had died. Cholera is a highly contagious infection that causes severe diarrhea. People mostly get it by eating food or drinking water that's been contaminated with feces. Across Africa, it's an unfortunate, unfortunate companion of every rainy season. Many villages have poorly built latrines that flood with the rains and pollute the wells and streams where people drink. Blowflies also spread the bacteria. After crawling out of toilets and landing on food, the diarrhea that results is clear and milky and quickly leads to dehydration. If people aren't treated immediately, they could die. During the famine, people out looking for food became the unwitting carriers. The cholera struck them on the roads and forced them to become sick in the bush. Rain, flies, and cockroaches then spread the infection onto the banana peels, roots, and corn husks that others picked up to eat. To combat the cholera, the clinic at the trading center started giving away chlorine to clean out drinking water. For months, it tasted like metal. They also advised families to cover the holes of their latrines to keep out the flies. My father made a lid from a piece of iron sheeting, but as soon as it was removed, the fat green blowfly swarmed out like biblical plague and smashed it into your head and face. It was a lot like working to swat them and finish your business at the same time. In those days, any signs of diarrhea near the latrine hold cause alarm. Each morning, the color of people walked past our house on their way to the clinic, their eyes cloudy and skin wrinkled from dehydration. I'd watch them until they got close. They'd run down the trail toward home. But as soon as they passed, the starving people would follow. Between hunger and cholera, we had many funerals in Wimbe. At home, Jeffrey's anemia grew worse. His legs became grotesquely swollen with quashing ring. If you touched his foot, your finger left a mark in his bubbled skin as if the foot, foot was made of clay. Can you feel it? I asked one day, touching the blisters. Does it hurt? I can't feel anything, he said. He also became dizzy and had trouble walking a straight line. One afternoon, I was taking him outside into the sunshine, but he stopped and said, wait, come back. I can't see. We stood there until his eyes adjusted to the light before we continued. For months, his mother had only served him pumpkin leaves, and now, like Kamba, my cousin was starving to death. With little else to do, my mother took half of our flour for the day and gave it to Jeffrey's mother. There's enough here for porridge, she told her. It isn't much, but I can't watch my own son suffer. We were all losing weight, especially me. The bones were now showing in my chest and shoulders. And the rope belt that I'd made for my pants no longer worked. Now I just pinched two belt loops together and tied them off with a stick twisting more as I got thinner. My arms and legs looked like blue gum poles and ached all the time. I had trouble squeezing my hand into a fist. One afternoon, I was pulling weeds into the field when my heart started racing so fast. I lost my breath and nearly fainted. What's happening with me, I thought. Terrified, I bent down slowly until my knees touched the dirt, then stayed there until my pulse returned to normal and I could breathe again. The same night I sat in my room with a lantern while the hunger played games with my mind. If I sat still enough, the walls began to spin in slow circles like a merry-go-round. I followed a centipede up the wall for what seemed like hours. When a mayfly flew close to the lantern, I grabbed it by the wings and asked it, how are you alive? What are you eating? One thing was certain, no magic could save us now. Starving was a cruel kind of science. Even my father, once a giant man, shriveled like a ra raisin. Sharp bones now replaced brawny muscle. His teeth seemed bigger. His hair was thinner. And for once I noticed the scars on his skin. 
one afternoon, he reported having trouble seeing across the courtyard. The hunger was robbing his vision, just as, as it had Jeffrey's. It seemed the thinner my father became, the more he wanted to weigh himself. He kept a maize scale hanging by a rope near the tool shed, and one morning I watched his routine. He walked out and gripped the hook, then hung there like a sack of grain, started stared, starting up the needle. He made a grunting sound and said, hmm, five kilos, mama. As always, my mother came and looked, but refused to weigh herself. The children were also forbidden. Like many women during the hunger, she'd started tying her mapongo tight around her waist like a belt. She said it confused her summit and tricked her heart from beating so, so fast, helping her to breathe. At night, she resorted to mind games to help us children. You're losing weight because you're thinking about food, she told us. Don't you know that causes your body to stress and burn more energy? My sisters cried. Aisha said, but mama, I don't want to become swollen. Then think about positive things, my mother told her. Do that for me. The one positive thing we could dwell upon was our maize crop. Out in our field, the stalks had grown as high as my father's chest. The first ears had begun to form, revealing traces of red silk on their heads, and the leaves and stalks were fading from deep green to yellow, while men withered and died all around us. Our plants were coming up fat and strong. 20 days, I predicted to my father. I'd say you're right. If I was indeed correct, then we had 20 days until the green maize was ripe enough to eat, what we lovingly called dow. It's equivalent to the American corn on the cob. When the kernels were are soft and sweet and pop between your teeth. All day and night, I dreamed of dough. By the beginning of March, the maize stalks had reached my father's head. At this, at this stage, the flowers told you everything. Once the red and yellow silk began to dry and turn brown, you could start checking for dough. I'd go from stalk to stalk, pinching the cob to feel the grain. If the kernels crushed, er, crushed early under my fingers, it was too early. But if they felt firm, then it was time. Every morning for a week, Jeffrey and I walked up and down the rows, pointing out ones that were nearly done. Then finally, I spotted a cob that appeared ripe and gave it a squeeze. It was firm. This one's ready, I said. Yeah, said Jeffrey, pointing to another. And so is this one, and this one, and this one. Our long-awaited day has finally arrived. Let's eat. Using the last of our energy, we ran through the rows, pulling the ripe dough and cradling them in our arms. Soon I had 15 ears, and Jeffrey had the same. We peeled back the first layer of husk and tied them all together, then draped the chain across our shoulders. The sight of Jeffrey and me running through the courtyard with necklaces of dough nearly caused a riot. It's ready, Aisha said, her eyes wide and excited. Ready. The dough is ready. In the kitchen, I stoked the coals on my mother's fire until they burned red. Soon, my sisters were crowded inside the door, fighting for space. Relax, I shouted. There's plenty of dough for everyone. I placed several cobs directly on the coals, then flipped them until the peels were crisp and blackened. I burned my fingers pulling a one off, then st stripped the streaming husk and began to eat. The kernels were meaty and warm and filled with the essence of God. I chewed long and slow. Each time I swallowed, I was returning something that had gone missing long ago. Looking up, I saw my parents in the doorway. I don't think this dough is ready, my father said, snatching one off the fire. He pulled out the silk and took his first bite. Within seconds, the blood of life, the blood of life seemed to rush back into his face. He knew he would live. It's ready, he said, and smiled. That afternoon, we must have eaten 30 ears of maize. As if heaven opened up, the first pumpkin in our field was also ready. My mother boiled them, seeds and all, and then served up baskets of steaming meat. My God, to have a stomach filled with warm food was one of the greatest pleasures in life. Jeffrey and his mother 
started coming over and enjoying meals of pumpkin and dough with us. Soon, the swelling in Jeffrey's legs went away, and he was smiling like his old self. For Jeffrey and me, March was like one big celebration. Each morning before work, we made a fire in the fields and ate a big breakfast of roasted maize and pumpkins. I remember a parable that Jesus told to the disciples, the one about the sower of seeds. The seeds planted along the road get stepped on and damped, damaged. Those planted in rocky soil can't take root, and the ones planted in the thorns get tangled in the barbs. But the seeds planted on fertile soil live and prosper. Mr. Jeffrey, we're like those seeds planted on fertile soil, not on the roadside, stepped on by everyone walking past. No, no, not us. That's right. We lived. We survived. Chapter 9, The Library. All across the district, the dough and the pumpkins were like a great army marching to save us from certain death. Of course, our lives wouldn't return to normal until the harvest, which was still two months away. And at night, the same blob of Nisima greeted us at supper, but at least it was the start of something better. In the trading center, people began to smile and talk about the future. As the district slowly reclaimed its energy, students at Kachako returned to school to resume their studies. But once my parents still couldn't afford my fees, I was forced to stay home. Besides some weeding, there was little work to do in the fields until harvest. I spent a lot of time in the trading center playing Bawo. Someone also taught me a wonderful game called chess which I played every day, but these games weren't enough to keep my mind stimulated. I needed a better hobby, something to trick my brain into being happy. Day and night, all I could think about was school. I missed it terribly. Then I remembered that a small library had opened the previous year in Wimbley, Wimby Primary. It was started by a group called the Malawi Teacher Training Authority, and all the books were donated by the American government. Perhaps reading will keep my brain from getting mushy. The library was housed in a small room by the main office. I entered and was greeted by a nice lady who smiled and said, come to borrow some books. This was Ms. Edith Sokello, who, who taught English and social studies at Wimbe and acted as a school librarian. I nodded, then asked, how do I do it? It was my first time ever seeing such a thing. Mr. Sokello pulled back a curtain to reveal three giant shelves that nearly reached the ceiling, each filled with books. The air smelled sweet and musty, an aroma I find comforting from, the, from that day forward. She explained the rules of borrowing books, then showed me the many titles available. I expected to find primary readers and other borrow Malawian textbooks. But to my surprise, these books came from all over the world, places like America and England, Zimbabwe and Zambia. I saw books on English, history and science, even novels for leisurely reading. I spent hours that morning sitting on the floor, flipping through papers and marveling at the pictures. For the first time in my life, I experienced what it felt like to escape without going anywhere. The books from other countries were especially fascinating. But I ended up checking out the same Malawian textbooks my friends were studying at school. It was the end of the semester, and my plan was to get caught up before classes started again. Back at home, I fashioned a hammock from flower sacks and strung it in between two trees. I spent my mornings at the library and during the warm afternoon, I read in the shade. Right away, Gilbert offered to help with my independent studies. Each day after school, he stopped by and explained the lessons. What did you, what did you cover in science? I'd ask. Weather patterns. Can I get your notes? For sure. But as much as I love to read, I found it terribly difficult. For one, my English was bad and sounding out words took a great deal of time and energy. Plus, some of the material was confusing since I didn't have a teacher to explain things. In agriculture, I asked Gilbert, what do they mean by weathering? It's when rain breaks apart the rocks and soil. Ah, got it. One Saturday, Gilbert met me at the library just to look at books for fun. We couldn't study all the time. The first thing I spotted was the Malawi Junior Integrated Science book. 
used by the older high school students. Inside were, life, inside were lots of diagrams and photos of strange and interesting things. People with rabies and children stricken with quashicor. Like so many who wandered or wandered our country, one picture showed a man in a puffy silver suit. What's happening here, I asked. It says he's walking on the moon, Gilbert said. Impossible. Turn the pages. I saw a photo in Nakula Falls on the Shire River, located in southern Malawi. It's where ESCOM operated the hydro plant I mentioned earlier and where the country got its electricity. The only information I had was the river flowed downhill until it reached the plant. Then poof, there was power. How and why this worked, I had no clue. But this book explained everything. It was the water. It said the water turned a giant wheel at the plant called a turbine. And the turbine produced, um, produced the electricity. Well, I told Gilbert, this sounds exactly like the bicycle dynamo. It lights the bulb by also turning a wheel. The photo of Nakua Falls made me think about the dumbo behind my house. During the rainy season, there was always a waterfall. What if I put a dynamo underneath it, I said. The falling water could do spinning and produce electricity. We could listen to the radio whenever we wanted. The only problem would be running wires all the way so my, to my house, which could cost a fortune. And what would I do the rest of the year when the marsh was just a soggy swamp? I guess I'll have to research this a little more, I said. Later that day, we came across another fascinating book called Explaining Physics. It was also filled with photos and illustrations, mainly from England. To my surprise, it answered many of the questions I've been asking for a long time, such as how engines burn gasoline in order to move, or how CD players read the music on that shiny disc. For those of you wanting the same, it, it uses a laser beam. I find an entire section on batteries. Another photo demonstrated how brakes on a car worked. I'd always assume that cars and strips of rubber to stop the wheels like a bicycle. This book said otherwise. Vacuum brakes, I said? Wow, Gilbert, I really need to borrow that book. But explaining physics was way more difficult to read than integrated science. The words and phrases were long and complicated and not always easy to translate. After a while, I devised my own system by reading words in context. For example, if I was interested in a photo or illustration label, figure 10, and I didn't know what it meant, I'd comb through the text until I find where figure 10 was mentioned. Then I'd study all of the words and sentence around it, often asking Ms. Sakello to look them up in a dictionary. Can you look up the word voltage, I asked? Sure, any others? Resistor. Oh, and diode. Slowly, this is how I began learning English, as well as the sciences that would soon capture my imagination. After a couple of weeks of reading this book, I came across the most amazing chapters, the discussion of magnets. I knew a little about magnets because they found, they're found in radio speakers. I dusted off a few and taken them to school as toys, moving slivers of metal around through a piece of paper. The book explained how all magnets have north and south poles. The north pole of our magnet will stick to the south pole of another. Well, identical poles always resist. You're probably, you've probably experienced this yourself when playing around with those things. In fact, the earth itself has a liquid iron core that acts like a giant bar magnet in relation to its poles. Magnets, like the earth, have natural force fields that radiate between the poles. The south end of a bar magnet will always be pulled toward the north pole of the earth. That's how a compass works. The bar magnet inside always pulls north to keep you from getting lost. The most fascinating section was about electromagnets, which work by applying power to a coil of wire. Coil of wire. According to the book, you can make them out of everyday objects, such as nails and batteries. When electricity from a power source, such as a battery, passes through a coil of wire, it creates a magnetic field. 
The magnetic magnetic field can even can be even greater if the wire is wrapped around a good conductor, like a nail. The more it's wrapped, the stronger the electromagnet. The strength can be increased by using a thicker wire or by applying more power. The book showed giant electromagnets picking up uh, picking up cars and heavy pieces of metal, but smaller ones, it explained, help power simple simple motors to things like radios and car alternators. Aha, I said aloud. They're talking about radios. I was sitting on my hammock when I read the piece of information, this piece of information. It had taken me over a month to get this far in the chapter, mainly because of all the strange English words to learn. But now I've reached the juiciest part. How do these motors work? Well, in a simple electric motor, a coil of wire on a shaft sits inside a casing that's actually a large magnet. I knew this much by taking apart radio motors and unraveling the copper wire, mainly to make toys and stuff. When this coil of wire is connected to a battery or any power source and becomes magnetized, it gets all charged up and wants to fight with the larger magnet surrounding it. The push and pull between the opposing poles causes the shaft to spin. You know, the fans that we use in the summer to keep cool. The blades are spinning around and around because of this fight going on inside. During all of this fighting and spinning around, these motors produce their own kind of energy called alternating current or AC. There's a second kind of energy called direct current or DC, but that's mostly found in batteries. Direct current flows in one direction from one end of the battery to the others. While AC changes direction and can be used in more ways. It's also easier to transmit. Because of this, most electronics use AC power. The book gave an example of an AC generating motor, a bicycle dynamo. Aha, I said, remembering back when Jeffrey and I were playing with the dynamo and trying to power the radio, it didn't work when we'd attached the wires to the battery terminals, which only use direct current. But when we jumped jammed them onto the pole that said AC, the radio had come to life. The book went on. The movement energy of the dynamo is provided by the rider. Of course, I thought. That's how spinning motion generates power in a dynamo and in the ESCOM turbines on the river. I can't tell you how exciting this was for me, even if the words and phrases sometimes confused me. The drawings were clear in my mind. It was like seeing an entirely new language composed of symbols. Those were AC and DC, positive and negative. Batteries and switches in a current and various arrows showing the direction of current. Right away, I understood the language clearly, as if my brain had known it all along. About a month later, school ended for the semester and Gilbert had more time to hang out. One morning, we went to the library. But as soon as we arrived, Mr. Ms. Sakello hurried us to leave. You boys spend hours in here taking my time, she said. But today I have an appointment. Just find something quickly. The reason it always took so long was because the books were, were in disarray. They weren't shelved alphabetically or by subject, which means we had to scan every title to find something we liked. That day, as Gilbert and I looked for something good, I remembered an English word that had stumped me in one of my other books.